So how do you create a brand that truly represents who you are and the products you sell, as well as building a business that you can scale online? That is what this podcast will help you do. My name is Henry Kaminsky Jr. and welcome to the Brand Doctor Podcast. Let me just make this statement loud and clear. Turbulence here, turbulence here, turbulence here. What is shaking everybody? Today we have a we have a big shot in the house. Not not every day do we get a New York Times bestseller coming on the show and sharing his wisdom and experience with us today. Today we have my man Josh Linkner in the house. And man, dude, what a pleasure to meet you today. Well, it's truly great to be with you. I, I'm a big fan of yours, so it's uh, it's really cool to spend some time together. It's going to be an exciting episode. We're going to be talking about his brand new book that's going to be dropping April. April 20th. It's 420 for those that happen to like that number. It's easy to remember. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so the name of the book is called Big Little breakthroughs. So I am I am so interested on how you got the name of the book and your backstory. So share with the audience, please, a little bit of your backstory. What do you do and how you got to where you're at today? And then we'll dive into the book. Yeah. So thank you. I, I'm a non-traditional guy. I grew up in Detroit. I'm proud, still here in Detroit. I was born in the city, not the suburbs. And uh, I really started my career as a jazz guitarist. I've been playing uh, professional music now for over 40 years, believe it or not. Put myself through college playing music. But I was always sort of a tech geek. And at age 20, I had this weird idea to start a tech company. Never taken a business class or anything, but uh, got it off the ground and ended up selling it. And uh, I've been hooked on entrepreneurship ever since. I've had the chance to start, build, and sell five technology companies. I then started a venture capital fund here in downtown Detroit to help make a difference in our, in our community. So I've been involved in the launch of about 100 startups. And uh, this is coming out as my fourth book on the topic that's so near and dear to my heart uh, of human creativity and how to extract it from normal people and use it in a productive way. Oh my God, this is so fascinating. I want to encourage all of our live listeners to drop some questions in the comments and we'll highlight them um, during the show. I, I encourage that because not every day, like I mentioned, we have a New York Times bestseller with this amount of experience in entrepreneurship with us. So I definitely want to encourage that. Um, so let's let's take a quick break. I'm going to share a quick little message, and then we're going to dive deep, deep, deep into your new book that's coming out. If you're a business owner who feels your branding isn't truly representing the value that you deliver, check out this free video training that will help you level up your brand's messaging and online presence so that you can start attracting higher quality clients. Visit www.uniquedesignswithaz at the end, not an S, dot net backslash level up my branding. All right, Josh. So I love this title of this new book. Talk to me about how you came about with that title. Yeah. So for those that are unfamiliar, it's called Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. And the whole premise of it is sort of flipping the, the idea, the paradigm of innovation upside down. You know, too often we think that innovation only applies to people wearing a lab coat or a hoodie. It's like the billionaire club. And for most normal people, it's out of our reach. And this book, again, flips it upside down. It really helps everyday people drive everyday innovation. The title itself really comes from this notion of maybe you've seen a, a, a painting by a Van Gogh or someone that's called a pointillism, where basically you take a single dot, like my four-year-old daughter Talia could make a green dot on a page, no problem. And the dot itself is actually really simple. But if you put enough dots together in an interesting way, they add up to something magical. And that's exactly what Big Little Breakthroughs is all about. It's, it's placing high velocity, high volume, little teeny, safe, non-risky bets and they add up to great stuff. And it's just a way better way to approach creativity in our businesses and even in our personal lives. So I'm assuming this is the approach you took to get to where you're at today. 
Yeah, hundred percent. You know, we, we often think that creativity and innovation, again, it feels like these overwhelming words as if you, you know, a select few of us were imbued by the gods and the rest of us have to suffer. The truth is that all of us are creative, period. I mean, the research is crystal clear that as human beings, we are hardwired to be creative. That's our natural state. And the cool thing is that we can apply that skill. It really is a skill, not a talent. It's a skill that can be built and cultivated to almost everything in life that matters most to us. It's the difference between like winning a customer or losing it, getting a promotion or, or missing out, um, landing your perfect spouse or, or maybe not, you know? And so I think that we can apply creativity in all areas of our lives and the outcomes that matter most to us just get better. That's so true, man. That's so true. So I, I have to ask you, what's one big little breakthrough that you had over the past in the past 30 days. So I, you know, I, I'm always testing stuff and I screw stuff up all the time, by the way. One of the premises we talk about in the book is, is this experimentation mindset. So instead of thinking of creativity as like once a decade, you bet your entire life on it. It's like four or five a day and knowing full well that most of them will not work out, but some will. But I think my, my two favorites that I heard in the last 30 days, I actually come from uh, outside of me, but one of them was how do you cool off white wine? So let's say you open a bottle of wine, you, it's not cold enough. You can't stick ice in there because it waters down the wine. The solution, the big little breakthrough, frozen grapes. Boom, cools off the wine, doesn't dilute the flavor. Everything is perfect. So again, to me, this doesn't make the cover of a magazine, but it's like these are within the grasp of all of us. And in that context, truly, all of us can be innovators. Just wanted a quick business example, because I know you talk a lot about branding. So most restaurants are, are, are boastful, like the world's greatest pizza or New York City's greatest coffee or whatever. And, and we are, our BS detector is high. We know that's nonsense. It's a bunch of puffery. And it turns out that in Chinese restaurants in North America alone, there's over 65,000 Chinese restaurants. So how do you possibly stand out from the pack? Well, this one restaurant that just saw this the other day in, in Montreal, um, they do the opposite. So on their menu, next to every entry, there's a little section that says owner's comments. And it is brutally honest and hysterically funny. Like one entry says, this dish, isn't really, dish really isn't that good. You might want to try a different one. Or another one is, this one will put the pounds on. I probably gained five pounds from eating this dish alone. Or another one is like, you know, this really isn't that, that traditional. Some people like it, but hey, whatever's good for you. And so it's self-deprecating. It's funny. Instead of boasting about his food, he criticizes his own food. And you know what? Here we are talking about that restaurant today. Talk about standing out from the crowd. Everybody's zigging. He zagged or she zagged. And look what happened. Josh is on the Brand Doctor podcast talking about it. And that's that's the power of branding and that's the power of creativity. And I, I just, I don't accept when somebody says, well, I'm not the, you're the creative genius. I don't, I wasn't blessed with that skill. I say BS, if you want it hard enough, you will find a creative way to make it happen, even if it means you got to hire somebody else. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, but, though, you know, creativity, again, the, the, the research here is so clear. Harvard did a study and they asked this age old question, is creativity born or developed? Is it nurture or nature? What they learned is fascinating. Creativity, in fact, is 85 percent learned behavior which means that you and I, even on our worst day, have at least 85% the creative capacity as Mozart or Da Vinci or Picasso. You know, your brain chemistry and, and, and Paul McCartney's is almost identical in terms of creativity. Your ability to learn this as a skill is almost identical. So when we stop thinking that one out of a thousand of us have this special gift and instead think about that, look, if, if we can learn language, if we can learn to play tennis, if we can learn jazzercise, we can learn to be creative. Oh man, that is awesome. Listen, I have another question for you. Out of all the chapters in this new book, what was the chapter that you really, really enjoyed and really, really enjoyed writing and it really stuck out for you uh, when you were writing it? Yeah, so th this book was different than my previous ones, which I'm uh, proud of, but but this one I spent over a thousand hours in research and interviews with celebrity entrepreneurs, CEOs, billionaires, nonprofit leaders, amazing people all over the world. and. Um, it, it, the, the way the book is organized, the, the, the first half is around fundamentals, which is, you know, let's just let's debunk some common myths. Let's look at what the research is telling us. Let's understand the way the brain works and how we can grow our creative capacity. So, you know, it's not just opinion. It's, it's really versed in, in science. But the second half of the book, uh, Henry, I get into the eight core mindsets of everyday innovators. So there's one chapter for each of them. What I discovered from all this research and my own experience as well is that there are some common patterns, common approaches, common obsessions of, of everyday innovators. So, I, you know, it's hard to choose from those eight. It's sort of like, which is your favorite kid, you know, because like you, you like all your kids. But there were a couple that definitely struck a nerve with me. Um, as a Detroiter, one of them uh, is, is the principles is called 
use every drop of toothpaste. And it's just a clever way of saying that we, we can be scrappy. We can, we can make do with what we have. So often I hear people say, I'd love to be creative, but I don't have enough fill in the blank. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough computing power or talent or whatever, raw materials, office space. And, and the truth is that, that we have that capacity inside. Ingenuity, resourcefulness, that's free and renewable. And so using every drop of toothpaste is about getting scrappy and finding resourceful ways to move forward. And just one little quip, I mean, if the amount of external resources that you had equaled the amount of creativity that your organization has, the federal government would be the single most uh, creative organization on the planet and startups would be the least. And of course, we know the exact opposite is true. So yeah, use every drop of toothpaste. I love it. I love it. If you get anything out of today's episode, it's use every drop of toothpaste. Joshua Easter, he's one of our uh, contributing live guests, uh, uh, live inter- uh, uh, um, audience members, and he drops. Josh, you're gonna you're gonna love this. Well, you're both named Josh, which is gonna be funny, but Joshua drops. The, 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 the quotes, the nuggets, the gems that come out of each of our mouths every episode live on the show. So big shout out to Joshua Easter again. And, and it's so funny when you said use every drop of toothpaste. I actually, when I saw him come in, I was like, I know that's going to be one of his quotables today. <laughs> that's awesome. Let me go back a second, Josh. You talked about the first half of the book uh, deb- debunking some of the myths out there. Can you share a couple of those with us? Yeah, you know, one we hear all the time is that innovation only counts if it's a billion dollar idea or if it changes the world. I want people to think that of innovation in in different flavors. One flavor is all capital innovation, like literally written in all caps. And that's, you know, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or whatever. Nothing wrong with that, but but that represents such a small uh, tip of of what we can do. And again, it's, it's sort of out of reach for most people. The next one, one double click down is the word innovation just with a capital I, the rest lowercase. And these are way more accessible. These are innovations that might happen two or three times a year, but maybe it boosts sales by 14%. Like these could be meaningful, significant innovations that again are are much more accessible. But my favorite is one click down from that or what what the book is about is big little breakthroughs, all lowercase innovation, micro innovations. And these are so cool because we can cultivate them daily. We're learning the skill. They're way less risky and, and they just add up to big things. You know, one of the myths again about creativity is that you know, people are born like, like the first thing that you do, we're expected to have creative genius. But, you know, Da Vinci's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa, that wasn't his first painting. First, Da Vinci had to learn to paint. He had to paint every day. He had to paint a bunch of terrible paintings and, and screw stuff up. And eventually he unlocked his creative genius. So that's really the way that most people should think about creativity. Not that it should be perfect upon launch, but rather that there's a deliberate process to build and cultivate these skills. I love it, dude. Yeah. I, I listen, I'm a I'm a testament to that. You know, we've been I've been doing this for 14 years, podcasting for four. You know, it, it it's it's when you keep at it every day, believe it or not, you're getting better. And and as long as you keep at it, eventually it's gonna compound. That compound effect is very, very important to pay attention to. And 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 Josh spoke to that. So I want to have some some fun, and I want to I, I pull these these questions out of a out of a deck of random questions every episode. Um, so I have some fun questions here that we can that we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have you answer. So this one's gonna be fun because you're in the you're you know you're a techie. But so, what's your favorite gadget? My favorite gadget. Um... Well, I actually have to say two gadgets. One is I'm a musician. And so I'm always obsessed with like musical technology and that type of thing. And so um, I I, technically my favorite gadget is a Gibson Super 400 guitar, which is like this big mammoth, meaty, heavy jazz guitar. It's like bigger than I am. And it has, I keep like telephone wire strings on it. They're so thick, but it has this beautiful warm tone. And and, and really the thing is not that tech forward, but it's just this beautiful piece of equipment. But I I think more specifically to answer your question, um, I know it sounds kind of lame, but, but uh, ear, earbuds uh, from from um, Apple, and the reason is just I think it it allows you to um, to do to get more. So like I, I'm in transit all the time when when it's not COVID, I'm on a treadmill, whatever, and now I can be listening to books, I can be listening to podcasts like yours, and so to me that's sort of a game changer just because it provides sort of a new form of input. It's funny in tech we we always say if you want to change the output, you got to change the input. 
Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that people need to do more of if they want to develop creativity is sort of absorb the, the work of others. I actually, one, one, every day I do a simple ritual. It's one minute, literally one minute a day. That's it. Where I just sort of breathe in the creativity of others. I might watch live music on a, on a YouTube channel. I might listen to something. I might stare at a painting or read a poem out loud. But, but guzzling the creativity of others actually boosts our own creativity. And so those earbuds really help me do that. It helped me sort of take in as much as I can. If I want to change the outputs, it helps me change the inputs. Oh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, here's another one. Who are your heroes in real life? Well, probably one of my biggest heroes is was my grandmother. Unfortunately, she's been passed, you know, for for you know 30 some years, but but she she said something to me early on and she just gave me the 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 sense of you know to pursue what's possible. And it was really based around around limits, you know, that most people kind of put these superficial limits on, on yourself and they're like, she had kind of said in a number of different ways, what if you remove that limit? You know, someone has to achieve greatly. Why why not you? And that was just such an inspiring thing to me. She kind of gave me the belief in myself to pursue things that uh, would ordinarily seem rather risky. Um, I think today one of my heroes is my wife, Tia, who I'm, you know, I, I'm so lucky, man. I, I married way outside of my, my, uh, my weight class in terms of, you know, she's just awesome and smart and talented and, and nurturing. And just, she's, she's a hero of mine. And I, you know, I have four kids and, and to a degree, they're each my hero. Also, I have, I have a 23 year old, a 21 year old and four year old twins, which is a little crazy, but um, you know, I learn and grow from those guys all the time. So, you know, the cool thing is when we look at heroes, they don't have to be these famous celebrities. We can find heroes in each other. We can find heroes uh, in, in, in all those folks around us. And, and by the way, to be a hero doesn't mean you need to be perfect. You know, we all have flaws and there's something kind of awesome about that, but, but we can, we can still learn and grow from every person we come in contact with, even if they're traditionally more of a villain, we can still learn and grow from them. Oh man. Great points. Great points. Yeah. When you get that question, right, automatically default or like your knee jerk reaction would be, someone famous, right? Or, or, right. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be, I mean, to you, to you very much like you, Josh, my three and a half year old son is, is my hero, you know, seeing him grow and become the person that he's becoming every day. And this little personality that's now turning into a big personality. I wonder where he gets that from. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. And, and, you know, we, we share a lot of uh, synchronicity, um, with some of what you just said. So I, I, I wanted to share that my wife again is, is my rock and she's been so supportive since day one. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to have because business is a, you know, business is very scary. It's, it's, it's not guaranteed. There's so many unknowns, right? And when you're willing to go through that journey with somebody that really cares about you, you know, it's, it feels like, you know, the, the, the wind and the sun is always on your back. And, um, I love that you mentioned that because that's exactly how I feel. It's exactly how I feel. Hey, just okay, one so thing he, I've been thinking about recently, I just wanted to share, cause you mentioned, yeah, certain, please. so I feel like, you know, this is, you know, most people say, oh, I would never want to take a big risk. I would never want to try something, you know, cause what if it didn't work out, but, but I, you're just flipping that around for a second. Think about this. Think about the price that we pay for certainty. So if you flipped it around a listener saying, okay, I, I work at a, I just want my steady paycheck, whatever. But, but what if you were meant to be a, a, a billionaire? What if you were meant to change the world and invent some new drug therapy that would, you know, cure COVID or whatever. And, and instead of doing that, that it had some inherent uncertainty, you're essentially paying a huge price for certainty. I think very often we think that like certainty is, is free, but I would argue that's one of the most expensive luxuries that we choose to, to, to buy. And, and actually I think it's one that's probably not as affordable. Like, like if, you know, if you could quadruple your income and all you had to do is, is accept a little bit of uncertainty, you know, is it really worth paying three times your income for the certainty? Anyway, just a different way to think about certainty. Well, where my brain goes, Josh, is how boring would life be if everything was guaranteed, if everything was certain, you know, what is it? The six, the six human needs. One of it is one of them is certainty. One of is uncertainty to counterbalance that. And I just think it would be a, a boring ass life. If we woke up every day and knew exactly what was going to happen when it was, when it was going to happen. I, I, I that's not fun for me. Yeah, you know, and- 
you you hear people all the time, you know, on, the, on their last days on the earth, you know, they don't say, oh, I wish I took fewer risks. I mean, they always say, you know, there's regret for, for not trying something. And and by the way, I don't say this in a preachy way. Like I've screwed up so many things. I make mistakes constantly. I've tanked business ideas. I, I say this from with great humility. I know it's it's scary, you know, and no one wants to fail. And that, that's not fun. But I do think we owe it to ourselves at least to, to accept some uncertainty because the, the price that you're really paying ultimately becomes regret. Oh, you're not kidding. Gary V talks about this a lot, you know, go, go spend some time in a, in a, in a, uh, assisted living home and, and, and go volunteer and talk to some of these old folks and, and listen to what they say. A lot of it has to do with what you just said. And, um, uh, I don't know about you, Josh, but I'm living every day. Like, like it's my last. And, um, uh, when I'm 80, 90 years old, God, you know, God willing, you know, it's going to be a real colorful, <laughs> it's going to be real colorful, but there won't be many regrets. I can promise you that. I can promise you that. So I got one more question for you and we'll start to wrap up a little bit. What do you got your sights on moving forward for 2021? Last year was, was quite the year due to COVID. So, you know, what do you got your sights on this year and what are you excited about um, in 2021? Well, the way I look at it is that, um, and, and why I wrote the book really is that that human beings just have huge reservoirs of dormant creative capacity. I study this stuff and have for 20 years and I've got dormant creative capacity. So I know, know we all do. And, and the way I look at it is that imagine if everyone was walking around and they had an extra you know, million dollars that they didn't know was hidden in a pair of trousers or something. And, and you didn't help them find it. What a shame, because that, that could change their lives and their families and, and provide safety and shelter and all these things. Well, we're, we have something more valuable than that million dollars. We have creativity. And all of us do. There's 7 billion people walking around the face of the earth with dormant creative capacity. So for me, you ask me what's exciting to me is helping people unlock even a little bit of it. Here's the thing, that creative capacity, it's a high leverage activity. In other words, 5% more creativity could yield a thousand percent bigger results in the thing in our business or our lives or whatever else. So I feel like I'm in this mission. I know it sounds like a postcard, but man, I believe it in my soul to help unlock this dormant creative capacity to help everyday people become everyday innovators. And to me, it's not about selling books. It's not about monetary stuff. It's just about helping our planet, like get more creative. Because when we do, like, think about this. If we were 5% more creative as a country, educational outcomes would be better. Healthcare outcomes would be better. Community outcomes would be better. Business outcomes would be better. You know, and it's just like, if people got it, why not help them bring it to the surface? Oh man, that's beautiful. Joshua Easter, again, with a gem, he says, we all have reservoirs of dormant creative capacity, Josh Linkner. So he is like the quotable genius right here. That's awesome. <laughs> He's awesome. He's awesome. So appreciate you, Josh. Um, so you last question, and then we'll wrap up. Was there a compelling event that happened in your life that made you say, I have to write this book? You know, I think it was 30 years of events, you know, back to those big little breakthroughs. But, you know, I, I'm a kid from Detroit that plays jazz guitar. And so I, I, I didn't have, a, you know, a complex technical MBA skills or whatever, but I was able to, to enjoy some, some success. And, and the, the main through line for me was tapping into creativity. What I know is that I'm no more creative than anybody else. I'm just not. You know, I've studied jazz music, so I have some, you know, synapses that I built over time, but I'm no more inherently creative than anybody. And I saw the difference that it made in my life. It was so remarkable. And then when I see other people struggling, I just think to myself, gosh, if I could help them, and, and the one way to help them is, is unlocking this creative uh, ability. So to me, it was really, it's coming from the heart. It was just saying, how can we help normal folks not not I, I think big big driver for me was like again I look at Elon Musk maybe as the poster child of today is of, of innovation but why isn't every one of us the poster child of innovation that should be a universal thing if we have 360 million people in the US why not have 360 million innovators and, and how much better would, would we would we be if we did so man I love what you're pouring into this world dude honestly that one hit me hard right there that that's awesome that is awesome so what from one fellow creative to another my friend keep doing what you're doing because the world needs more josh linkners in the world so well, that's very awesome very kind stuff. of you to say thank you so much and, and again what, a, what an honor to spend some time with you today dude where can people can you pre-order the book can you where can we go to get this this gem when it comes out yeah so check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com 
Um, yes, you can pre-order it. There's audio book, there's di digital, whatever. But even if you don't buy the book, which is okay, there's tons of resources on that site. There's downloadable worksheets. There's a free creativity assessment. There's a whole bunch of goodies. And, and my wish, look, if you want to buy the book, awesome. But if you don't, please still go to the site because I think it can be helpful to you. It can provide you some real you know, practical tools to extract this creative capacity. So again, just biglittlebreakthroughs.com. And the book is out on uh, 420, the date you can't forget. <laughs> that is awesome, dude. <laughs> I'm still cracking up. Uh, one of my good friends is going to really enjoy buying that book on that day. I can promise you that. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be sparking all kinds of creativity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Josh, thank you so much for being an phenomenal guest and you are you are an awesome guest like you could tell you are a pro at interviews i just want to let you know the way you you pause and the way you stop and the way you think think the questions through and the way you answer i just wanted to tell you you are a phenomenal guest and oh, i would love to have you back i would love to have you on some live streams because we do we do a lot of live streams on our youtube channel and in our, inside of our facebook group um and by the way, guys, if you aren't part of that Facebook group, just go to Facebook and type in the Brand Doctors Hangout, and uh, you'll see it. You'll see my big mug right there. I, I highly encourage you join that group because there's about 780 of us now, and it's growing very quickly, and everybody is helping each other out. Everybody wants to grow together, and there's some geniuses in that group that I'm learning from every day. So highly encourage that. But Josh, thanks so much for joining us today and good luck with the book. I am definitely picking up a copy. I'm dying to get into this, um, this information and, and share it with the world. So thank you again. Thank you. Have a great one. You got it. So guys, that is another episode in the books. Hope you enjoyed Josh's pure gold that he dropped. And I hope it encourages, encourages you to, to dig in and, and, and find and reallocate that creativity because it's there. You just got to tap into it. So have an amazing day, guys. Hey guys, if this episode can help somebody else unlock their potential, I want you to share it with them today. And if you haven't left a review yet on iTunes or Spotify, go drop a review, good or bad. I want to know so I can make this show better for you each and every episode. Guys, I love you. I appreciate you. And I will catch you on the next episode real soon. Take care.